Um, for me, it's a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Egley. He's Assistant Professor of Cell and Developmental Biology in the Department of Pediatrics at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. He's also a Senior Research Fellow at the New York Stem Cell Foundation Research Institute. Now, Dr. Uh, Eichelin received his PhD in biology in 2003 from the University of Zurich. He then joined the famous lab of Dr. Egan at Harvard University, who was really a pioneer in stem cell research. And as a postdoctoral fellow, he studied the mechanisms of reprogramming uh, eggs after nuclear transfer in uh, various animal models. And um, he's also been conducting research on human cells when he moved to the New York Stem Cell Foundation. And the hopes, one of his projects was very interesting, is to understand how human eggs can reprogram the DNA as they get uh, exposed to it or transferred. But one of his long-term research goals is to produce human stem cells that can be used to cure or to treat diabetes. This is a very, very important area of stem cell research. And I'm confident that his research will lead to a faster um, therapy for diabetes. But in addition to all of this, he's been very involved at Columbia University to try to get a program started to engage in clinical trials to use mitochondrial transfer uh, replacement tr uh, therapy to cure these people either to allow them to have children who are healthy and to use this technology, genetic technology for human reproduction. So uh, he just told me that we just got IRB approval for this, and that's very exciting. So let's give Dr. Agli a big hand. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation to speak here. Um, I'm very glad to be here and talk to you about these exciting lines of research. So I'm a scientist. And what I'm going to tell you today is not what you're going to use tomorrow. But I'm more going to make a broad picture of how human reproduction might change with the advances to, that we are currently making in the laboratory. So I'm a trained scientist. I'm a PhD. I have um, spent a lot of my time in the lab. And I do work with human cells, including human egg cells. And we have learned how to do things in those egg cells that, that are, I believe, relevant for human reproduction. But the, the, these are still relatively early days. So there's still a lot more to do until this becomes you know, relevant for, for patients. Even though, as, as we can now say, is that we have IRB approval for conducting some early um, clinical studies. In order for you to understand what I'm going to talk about, I'm also going to give a brief introduction about mitochondria. This is necessary. Um, mitochondria are what give us the power. So if you eat a cookie in there in the back, this has sugar in it. The mitochondria uh, metabolize that sugar, and they make it into an energy that helps me move my muscles. Every cell has many of those mitochondria. They really generate the power that we have. Um, and in addition to generating the power, so for them to be able to generate that power, they need to have specific proteins that make those mitochondria. And those proteins are in part made from a DNA, piece of DNA from a genome that is in the mitochondria themselves. And so here, this piece of DNA is drawn as a circle. It's a relatively small piece of DNA. We all have a tremendous amount of DNA in every cell. It's called the nucleus. Our chromosomes have a tremendous and enormous amount of DNA, 3 billion base pairs. And in this uh, tiny piece of DNA, there's just 16,000 base pairs. So it's a lot smaller than the DNA in the main nucleus. But you can see here that each of these segments, they, they encode a protein or a part that is actually essential for the function of that, those mitochondria. And in addition, um, of course, every DNA can have a mutation. And these mutations, what well, they can cause disease. And so when these mitochondria are mutated, 
it can affect all organ systems because every cell type depends on a form of cellular energy. That can be the muscle, the heart, the brain, the eye, and the ear. So people who have mutations in mitochondria, they can become deaf, they can, you know, have um, mental uh, problems, they, they can have muscle weakness, they may not be able to do exercise or, or uh, work out, they um, can have kidney problems. Um, and so it, it is usually very, very severe disease. Like many inherited diseases, they are difficult to manage, they may not be curable, and they often result in death of the child. Mitochondria are unique in because they have a very special form of inheritance. It is only the mothers who inherit the mitochondria to both son and daughter. So the sperm does not carry mitochondria. Mitochondria, there are many of them, and they take up space. So the egg cell is a large cell, the sperm cell is very small, and does not really have enough space for contributing mitochondria, so that's why this little sperm here is drawn without. The egg does have mitochondria, and so after fertilization, the mitochondria come from the egg cell. That also means that mutations that are present in families, they are transmitted from mother to child. And how often does this occur? Well, it's not very common, but it occurs often enough to be a clinical concern. In England, that's where detailed studies were done, it's about one in 10,000 people who have this disease because of this, an inherited disease. But the mutations in mitochondria are actually more common. About one in 200 people carry mutations in the mitochondrial DNA and potentially can transmit those to the offspring with devastating consequences. So how does this look like in a family? Well, okay, here's a family and with the box, that's a man, and the circle is a woman, and uh, the bo a shaded box carries the mutation, and you can see here that this man has two children, and the children don't have that mutation. Well, it's because fathers don't transmit that mitochondrial mutation. And, and then here, actually, he's affected, but his children are not. And then here, the, that this woman is not affected, but she has two affected children, and one of them actually passed away. Well, if you look at the genes of that family, it is this mother who passed on the mutation to that son and, the, and to her daughter, and this daughter passed on the mutation to all kids, but this father, of course, did not pass them on because sperm does not carry mitochondria. And so you can see here that it transmit maternally from mother to child for generations potentially. Now, mitochondria, what can we do about this? How can we cut this off? How can we um, eliminate these mutations and make sure that a family like that can have healthy children? Well, we and others came up with a technology um, to, to make that happen. So mitochondria are actually distributed in the egg. So here you look at an egg. And the egg, um, this would be the nuclear genome. Here is magnified. This nuclear genome is magnified. There's a lot of blue. As you can see, that's the stain for the DNA. And then out here, these red dots, these are all the mitochondria. You immediately see there are many, many red dots out here. So you can also see that the nuclear genome, which really makes up who we are and how we look, and our characteristics is located separately from these mitochondria. So you can pull this out of the egg and then you don't have a nuclear genome associated with these mitochondria anymore. So that's what is done here. Well, to be fair, a tiny bit is also still associated with that nuclear genome, but largely you can pull out that nuclear genome and then this is now a schematic, but essentially that's how it's done. Okay, so one woman who is, would be affected with um, abnormal mitochondria, she donates her egg, and then there is another woman who also donates her egg. And here the mitochondria are normal, but it's this woman who wants to have a child. So what is done is we pull out this nuclear genome, 
without the mitochondria and transfer it into an egg that has her genome removed. So after this manipulation, this egg, egg carries her nuclear DNA, but normal mitochondria. And so when this is fertilized with this woman's partner, then uh, she will have an embryo with normal mitochondria. And so that child should not have the mitochondrial disease. Now, how is this practically done? Well, in fact, it not much changes compared to standard in vitro fertilization, um, at least for the patient. There's more in manipulation that's being done that's not common to normal to IVF how it's done today, but in principle, the IVF process remains the same for the patient. There is egg recruitment, which involves a hormone treatment, then there is egg harvest, then there is this manipulation that I just explained, the mitochondrial replacement, and the rest is all the same. It's in vitro fertilization, embryo growth and development. There's a genetic testing that will be involved and perhaps embryo freezing. That's all uh, already standard uh, practice in IVF. So, but in order to get there clinically, we first had to do the research to show that this indeed works. And what we did, essentially, we do proof of concept experiments that don't involve the generation of a human being, but merely involve the generation of cells that we can then investigate in the culture dish. So that's again an egg. We performed that exchange and then looked at various things, like how many mitochondria, is that, are these mitochondria indeed replaced? How does this have an effect on the nuclear genome? Does this have an effect on the activity, the overall health of that cell? And these are just some pictures which I really like because you know, this really shows how these look like. And that's what is from my own lab, that's what we have done. And, and what you see here is this is the human egg cell. And then you here you see this little piece that contains the nuclear genome of another egg that's transferred into this egg. And then after, during development, you can see here there's a one cell stage. Then this egg starts to divide. It makes four cells. It makes eight cells, 16 cells. And this is called the blastocyst. And the blastocyst has this inner cell mass. Now, I just told you we, our intention, first intention was not to make a human being here, but to simply test whether this actually works. So we made stem cells from this, from this inner cell mass. Um, this is just another example of such a blastocyst. We know it also works if we cryopreserve the egg before doing the manipulation. That's just practically really useful. And it's relatively efficient. You know, about 30% of the eggs develop to the blastocyst stage. So the question we had is, how complete is this exchange? Do the mitochondria that we don't want disappear? And you can see that immediately after transfer, about 0.5%, more precisely 0.3% of the mitochondria originate from the egg from which we have transferred that nuclear genome. So there is a little bit of carryover. But eventually, this carryover appears, disappears entirely. And the mitochondria are entirely derived from that other egg that has the healthy mitochondria. <clears throat> so this is good news. So it seems to work. Uh, here we derived stem cells. These are just some pictures of stem cells. They have a normal karyotype, so normal nuclear chromosomes, which is important uh, for cellular health. And what we can do with stem cells, we can then turn those into any cell type we want and then investigate whether they behave normally. So if that those had become a human being, those cells would be existing in the human being, but here we have them in culture. We can make those cells in culture and then test, do they behave normally? That's very important before something is used clinically because it will tell us whether our manipulation had any adverse consequences. So these are simply fibroblasts, kind of skin cell. Um, and what we did is we looked at whether the mitochondrial activity has changed. So this would be the original skin cells, and this would be the exchange with the skin cells with the the exchanged mitochondrial genotype. And you can see here in that those two cell types made after this, we call it swap, because we exchanged the mitochondrial genome. You can see here that this mitochondrial activity is just as much as in the original skin cell. So the original skin cell is derived from the, the person who donated the eggs. 
So what that meant for us is that our manipulation had no adverse effect on the activity of the mitochondria. So that's good news because that would mean that the manipulation itself is, appears safe, at least in that regard. So from this research, we could conclude that we can have good and efficient development of the, the exchange of the genome, the replacement of the mitochondria. We know that we carry over only very few mitochondria with this manipulation, and that essentially the, the exchange becomes complete. We investigated those cells for over one year. We um, did, did a lot of different experiments to show that this works well. And so we concluded that this should be effective at preventing mitochondrial disease. We have talked to the FDA about that, and they are now considering this for clinical application. So this should allow uh, families who have that disease to cut off these mitochondrial mutations and have ch children who don't have that disease. And of course, that's wonderful. But they would still be part of, genetically related to her, ma to her mother. Of course, there are other options. One can do embryo adoption, one can do adoption of a child, one can do um, other, other ways to reproduce or to have a child. But some families, they wish to have a child who is uh, genetically related to them, and I think this provides them with that opportunity. Um, so others have actually shown that this works well in monkeys. So these monkeys, uh, monkey babies look quite healthy. So there's clearly a lot has been done to show that this technique should work and should be safe when used in humans. And that's very important that appropriate research is being done before something is translated to us. Because we don't want to learn after the fact that, oh wow, we didn't consider that. There's actually a bad effect. So, so far, we don't see any such bad effect, and that's very encouraging. How does this, what, what is that exactly, this mitochondrial replacement? There's a lot of, um, you know, people respond to this kind of new therapy in very strong ways, and sometimes in very different ways. Some are very opposed to it, others are very much for it, Sometimes people don't completely understand what it is, and that's what makes them fearful of a new technology. And what, what people are often concerned about is, you know, we are doing something that human beings should not be involved in. And this is not the work human beings should be doing, because we are essentially affecting the genetic makeup of a human being. But in this particular case, we um, do not directly modify the DNA of that person. We merely affect how the DNA is inherited. So it's not um, something that, it's not a genetic modification. In a sense, we're not creating here a genetically modified human being. This is not what this is. And that's often misunderstood. So this does not alter the inheritance of nuclear genes that determine how we are and how we behave. So this is not, would not allow to design um, physical features of a human being. It merely affects the inheritance of these damaging mitochondrial mutations. This technique may not only be relevant for mitochondrial disease, it is possible though not yet determined, that this could also be effective for women who suffer from infertility, especially at advanced age. If the nuclear genome is still intact, it, may, it might be possible that one could transplant that nuclear genome into an egg of a woman of a younger age with complete and efficient developmental potential. But this research has not been done yet. So, the mitochondrial replacement for that purpose, we don't know. So there needs to be, just like for the mitochondrial replacement for mitochondrial disease, there needs to be first the appropriate research being done for that to happen. 
but it's a possibility that this uh, could come true as well. Then furthermore, what is now uh, very much a topic of recent discussion is can we directly edit genes in embryos? And that's, again, a very exciting um, area of research. But again, it must be stated that before any clinical translation, it's very important to do the research to determine whether this is useful and safe. But it's very clear that there is a need for something like that. We all carry disease-causing mutations. In most cases, they don't cause overt disease. They may predispose us to certain diseases. And we, of course, we inherit them. And depending on the combination with our partner, they may actually cause disease. PGD is, of course, a safe and very effective technique, as explained in the previous talk, for most single gene disorders. But it may, is not an all-fixing uh, possibility. In particular, if more than one mutation is present, it becomes more challenging. And we actually carry more than one disease-causing mutations. So if we are to eliminate those disease-causing mutations, we may need more effective tools. So gene editing tools may be useful for that. These, of course, are different from what I've shown you before. They actually modify the DNA sequence. So this is a very different level of manipulation. Before that can be used, it's very important to do meaningful research to determine safety and efficacy and evaluate what is this useful for or not. So as I showed you, um, the human genome contains many uh, damaging mutations. This is just one example of one person. And what we've sequenced here is the genome, the protein coding genome of that person. And through computer algorithms, we called 286 potentially damaging mutations. That's a staggering amount. So we don't exactly understand what these mutations do. They're all present in one person. We don't know whether they have a negative effect on health or not. So of course, there is also, for, to apply this technique, we also need to have a better understanding of human genetics. And that's, of course, being pursued in many labs across the world. But if we, were, if we knew that these were indeed damaging and want, we wanted to eliminate them, PGD would not be useful because it's simply too many. One would have to use a different technology like gene editing to fix that. And at least in one uh, paper that was published last year, uh, a group in China showed that you can use gene editing to fix a mutation in the human embryo. They use that on a beta globin gene, which causes beta thalassemia. That unfortunately, one can say, well, this is, this is promising, but they found that there are multiple problems with this technique at this point. They found additional, so what these sequences show, this would be normal. But in, in these embryos, in addition to that normal sequence, they found new mutations. So the technique does not only fix mutations. Right now, it also introduces new problems. And that's, of course, not what we want. These new problems are this deletion here. You see there's a gap here. And then these r new red pieces, these are new mutations that the technique introduced. So that's not something we can do for a human germline. We cannot introduce, respond. It would be irresponsible to introduce changes that have potentially more damaging effects than what we fixed. Uh, but, you can, but of course, the, the technique is promising. Nevertheless, we have in this area of research, in this field, we have a significant problem. In order to develop such promising technologies, we need to do the research, as I just pointed out. However, the NIH, the National Institute of Health, often has taken the approach to we are, don't, we are not involved in this. And Rabbi Flaum has pointed out that doing uh, these things on human embryos is challenging in this environment because many people have hesitations, have perhaps uh, religious obstacles to, to do something about it. Um, 
Well, I mean, we don't know exactly what played into it, but I'm very glad to hear Rabbi um, Flaum talk that this say, talk about how important it is to do embryonic stem cell research, and that there is a misunderstanding about um, you know early embryonic development and, and the status of what of, of what we can do and what is responsible and ethical to do. There's an ongoing discussion, and I think people like you can have a very important impact in this. Um, so, assisted reproduction, you can see it has started maybe um, in, in the 70s. Also then it was basic science, researchers and clinicians who worked together. It's just like that today. We have scientists uh, who work with clinicians who are involved doing IVF clinic. Uh, right now, it's no longer about making IVF alone. It's also how we progress and improve those technologies, how we eliminate disease, uh, how we further improve uh, human reproduction. So, oh, okay. Um, there is clearly new applications in IVF developing in human reproduction. There's tremendous opportunities for both research and clinical translation. Um, and I have wonderful collaborators. Uh, this is in principle Mark Sauer at the Col Center for Women's Reproductive Care, actually just a few blocks from here near Columbus Circle. And for the mitochondrial disease, uh, the Department for Neurology, Michio Hirano. Um, and, uh, oops. and with this, I would like to thank you. You have a question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to hold the questions up.